Hello and welcome to this third installment of the Venus and Lymphatic Forum. We are broadcasting from the DeBakey Live studios at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. I am Ulysses Baltazar and I'm your host Baltazar. today. So today, um, before we start our presentation, I'd like to invite our viewers that if uh, you have any questions or comments, to let us know through any of these uh, social media platforms. We'll do the best we can to answer your questions. All that being said, uh, today's presentation, I believe, is going to be very interesting and very, very inter informative. We have a very special guest, a friend of mine for many years. I know him since I was a general surgeon at uh, East Tennessee State University, and frequently we interact with the University of Tennessee. And our guest always distinguished himself uh, because <coughs> seeking excellence not only in teaching, research, but performing vascular surgery. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Stevens. He is a vascular surgeon, professor of surgery, director of the endovascular surgery, and co-director of the University of Tennessee mm -hmm. Aortic Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. It is an honor that uh, you have uh, accepted our invitation. Thank you for being with us, Scott. And um, one thing before we start, I apologize for the delay. We have some technical difficulties, but we are ready to go. So Scott, welcome, and the, the stage is yours. Ulysses, thank you. I'm grateful to present here from the hills of East Tennessee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Well, and I'm thankful for the audiovisual team for their uh, last minute rescue. They've done a great job. Next slide. You, you are controlling the, the slide, Scott, so you just feel uh, free and control the slide. You are in control of that. Got it. I work at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. We're nestled right up against the hills of the Smoky Mountains. And uh, I'm thankful to be here the day before Thanksgiving, and I appreciate everybody uh, paying attention. The topic I'll address today is treating superficial veins and the philosophy of creative disruption and how critical it is in maintaining a leadership role in treating our patients. Now we live in a nested world. The uh, world is a place where I have a brain as a person and we have people and we're part of teams and teams are part of a business unit and the business units are part of corporations and corporations are part of industries which are part of economies. And business theories, statements of causality, that is what causes what and why can be applied up and down these units. The fundamental mechanisms are durable across these levels. Creative disruption is a theory of causality and what causes what and why. As first described by Clayton Christensen at the Harvard School of Business, and he put on these theories like a lens to dissect methods of success and failure, not only in businesses, but at each level of our nested world. Our careers and our interior lives. Creative disruption describes mechanisms of how dominating industries, such as steam locomotives, integrative steel were upended, and how business like, like Blockbuster videos was crushed by Netflix. It can also be used to examine our careers and our interior lives. It's a tool to predict mechanisms of success and failure. If you can advance to the next slide. Scott, you have the control of the slides. You need to change the slides from in your end. There you go. Got it. Back in 1987, 18, 1987, this was before cardiologists did interventions in an era where cardiac surgeons were the special forces in healthcare. I clearly remember early in my career chatting in the doctor's lounge with an outstanding cardiac surgeon and friend. He was mocking the cardiologist while he and his entire OR team waited on standby for a new therapy called coronary artery angioplasty. He called it a scheduled heart attack. 
At that time, relative to open heart surgery, these catheter procedures were technically simple and poorly efficacious. So why in the world should a clunky angioplasty catheter cause this esteemed cardiac surgeon to be concerned about his career and indeed the future of his specialty? I'm having a, a difficult time advancing my slides. Scott, can yes. you hear me? Are you having trouble with yes. your slides? Advance, Advance next, next slide, slide, please. That's, That's it. it. Should, Should we, we ask, ask ourselves, ourselves back, back in the air when cardiac surgeons, surgeons were the most highly trained and capable of all in medicine and surgery, what heart surgeons said, let's go out and get crushed by balloons and catheters. And on what day did they send out an email announcing that this clunky technology would crush their specialty? The answer, of course, is that no one made the decision. In fact, not addressing the issue was the problem. They responded to competitive pressure by doing what they did best. They redoubled their efforts on their defining skill. In business terms, you would say they protected the upper end of their market, which was grafting coronary arteries. But because they focused independently and did what seemed right in those specific circumstances, when it's summed up, it's summed up to disaster for cardiac surgery. According to Clayton Christensen, a professor at the Harvard School of Business, such a situation is described as creative disruption, where the same characteristics that make an entity successful are the exact same reasons it is vulnerable to being eclipsed. Because successful cardiac surgeons focused intensely on the technical aspects of the procedure, which is what made them excel, they missed the dramatic potential of catheter-based coronary interventions. Next slide. Let's look a little deeper into the business world and dissect another example of disruptive innovation. 1992, many of us in the room witnessed this story. Blockbuster dominated the movie rental industry. It has stores all over the country and what appeared to be a stranglehold on the market. Next slide. Now, Blockbuster didn't make money from movies sitting on the shelves and made it by renting videos. Therefore, it's important to turn the videos around quickly so they could be rented over and over. And Blockbuster realized it didn't like uh, returning movies, so it raised the late fees. In fact, it raised the late fees so much that it was the company's main source of in in income. So why in the world, the next slide, should Blockbuster be concerned about a little company named Netflix? Their business model was innovative. It was the opposite of Blockbusters. Customers paid a monthly subscription and the videos were mailed to them. No retail store needed, no bricks and mortars. And when customers didn't return the videos, Netflix saved money on operations, shipping and inventory. Because remember the subscription already been paid. Netflix was a quintessential David against Goliath. And when Netflix demonstrated early signals of potential with streaming technology, uh, they thought it was just a niche and uh, they thought they should just stick with their high ROI, which was doing what they did best, renting videos. Now, Netflix thought that this uh, was fantastic because it didn't need to compare or compete with existing profitable business. Its baseline was no profits and no business at all. They thought this niche was uh, just great. Next slide. When Netflix demonstrated early science potential with streaming, blockbuster investors got a bit concerned and pressed the giant company to survey the landscape and figure out what Netflix was up to. And its analysts reported that Netflix streaming addressed the niche market and their business model was not financially robust and they should stick with doing what they did best. Next slide. So it was right. Just last January, as reported in the New York Times, Netflix had over 24 million customers and 125 billion net worth. And because now they make their own movies, Netflix plans to eclipse Hollywood and make their own. Next slide. And Blockbuster, well, it declared bankruptcy in 2010. Next slide. 
So let's take a look at how creative disruption works. The vertical axis is performance and the horizontal is time. The color lines represent all levels of the existing market. The curved black line is a disruptor. It comes up from below and takes over the low end of the market. That's the part that nobody wants. Over time, because of competitive pressures, advances are made, performance improves, and the disruptor ultimately takes over the incumbent. And by the time the incumbent figures out what's happening, it's usually too late. Next slide. Please note the disruption principle that demonstrated the fall of Cardex surgery and Blockbuster also explains how other corporations fail. For example, Amazon, online selections killed coffee, employees, and the bricks and mortar borders books. Toyota, smaller and cheaper, upended Detroit. Fidelity online investing, convenience and price, that replaced your stockbroker. And Orbitz and Travelocity, you know your friendly travel agent is missing those commissions. Next slide. So I had the opportunity to travel to Boston and study with Professor Christensen at the Harvard School of Business. Next slide. And he's written several acclaimed books on business theory and many have become best time sellers. He is the architect and foremost authority on disruptive innovation. Next slide. Next slide. And I must say he was an extremely warm and humble man and recently he's applied, applied these theories to difficult social issues in families, education, and healthcare. And we discussed how these theories could be applied to our specialty, Bain problems. Next slide. So what's the recipe for failure? If we do veins as an add-on to our busy arterial practice, if we only do the high ROI procedures, closures, and we try to use the existing business model, specifically the same parking, the same hospital, the same OR, the same financials and the same waiting room. They say if you chase two rabbits, you won't catch either one. So what's the recipe for success? Well, you need a sonographer and a stenographer. It's critical to have a good uh, sonographer to get uh, vein pathology treated correctly. You need a stenographer to correctly wordsmith the data that's accurately gained so you can uh, get the insurance pre-approval you need. You need the drive and the will, the knowledge and the skills, and you definitely have to keep the cost down. Next slide. Uh, this is the vein map drawn on a typical patient that I treat by my uh, sonographer and I rely on uh, the vein map. It's a critical piece of successful therapy. You have to have a dedicated sonographer. Next slide. These are some ways I keep costs down in my uh, practice. The table is from a restaurant supply, not from a medical supply. And you notice the um, uh, working tool chest is actually a cobalt from Lowe's. So pre-procedural critical pieces. Next slide. Uh, you need to be an ally of your patients. You need to be an advocate, an asset. You need to describe the pathology clearly with unique analogies that the patients can understand. Uh, I use things like milking a cow, pinching a watermelon seed, one way on the interstate. Uh, you have to have a, a coherent uh, message from your website, your receptionist, uh, to your office to court and follow calls. And you need to help them understand that veins are a chronic condition, uh, not a a one and done like an appendectomy. Next slide. You also need to have good photography. It's difficult for patients to remember the extent and severity of their problems. You need a high quality uh, photography with a light blue background and optimal oblique lighting. I also have a stand uh, uh, so they can be at eye level when I take their picture and I have them walk around and leave their socks off for a day before I do the photography. Next slide. Uh, light blue background is key for the uh, best vein photography. Next slide. It's important to know that part of the spectrum of venous disease is a uh, difficulty remembering how severe the veins were. And it comes in very handy, next slide, to have before and after pictures uh, to show the patient so they'll understand the magnitude of their disease. Next slide. Next slide. 
So it's critical that you separate the vein uh, work from a high acuity arterial practice. It needs to have a spa atmosphere. There needs to be team coherence. It needs to be easy access and parking. Uh, this is uh, my vein uh, reception room. Next slide. Uh, it's important that they understand their financials, that there are no surprises. It's important to remember that there's variability between and within insurance plans. There's a difference between pre-certification, which basically means they say it's medically necessary, but it doesn't mean they'll cover it or pay for it, uh, which is in distinction from predetermination. And it's important to realize that insurance coverage for superficial veins is decreasing. Next slide. I use Valium uh, for sedation only on about half of my cases. The rest are just straight local. I give five milligrams on arrival. Um, it comes in handy for their first procedure where they're anxious. If they take a Valium, they need a driver. I never use Valium in elderly or frail patients and I never use it with narcotics. Next slide. It's important to remember if they're females of childbearing age, if they're pregnant, if they're breastfeeding, or if they anticipate becoming pregnant, uh, to be careful what medications you use. Uh, I'll often have them uh, pump and dump uh, for a 48 hour period if they're breastfeeding. Next slide. So the critical pieces of thermal ablation. It's really eclipsed open techniques. Uh, the ability to navigate with ultrasound imaging and tr transmit energy via catheter has been a game changer. It's responded to market pressures, it's iterated, it's moved upstream, and it's eclipsed the standard open techniques. It started out with lasers and expanded to radio frequency, and the thermal techniques have an excellent safety and efficacy profile uh, that are both pretty similar. Uh, due to difficulties with rigid catheters and traversing tortuous veins, a thermal ablation is optimal for greater saphenous veins, short saphenous veins, anterior accessory veins that are straight, large, and deep. But you have to be aware of the uh, nerves that are adjacent. For my tumescent, I use no ep epinephrine. I found that it eliminates the tachycardia from the IV injections that can occur, and it eliminates that, those occasional small eschars that happen at the points of injection. Do note that it decreases the safe dose of lidocaine from seven milligrams per kilogram to four and a half milligrams per kilogram. For thermal ablation, I make sure that uh, the, the room is warm, the prep is warm, the ultrasound gel is warm. I have a warming pad underneath the patient. It really helps avoid vasospasm. At first, I raise a wheel in the dermis with a small 30 gauge needle. That's the only pinprick they should fill. After that, I slowly advance the tumescent through a wave of advancing analgesia uh, through a 21 gauge uh, microcatheter I use to cannulate the vein. Once I get access to the vein, I'm injecting. I start on top of the catheter as I inject to keep a parallel tra trajectory from the needle and the um, radio frequency catheter. I also have a technique where I do antegrade and retrograde tumescent through the uh, access size and usually I can do a greater saphenous vein with two injection ports. Now uh, with uh, thermal ablation, it's important to push down the vein a, a centimeter from the skin with a tumescent. I never use sutures. I use stereo strips uh, cut in thirds. I place them parallel to the incision, not perpendicular to avoid any traction blisters. I never use adhesive. I use an eccentric elastic wrap for 24 hours, typically ace bandages, so they can rewrap them if they're too tight. I have them walk in the room prior to discharge, so if there's any bleeding, I can find it in the room before they get out of the, out of the office or into the waiting area. I never use narcotics, I use nonsteroidals, and I encourage gentle cardio activity. Next slide. I do as many axial veins as a patient is comfortable. Uh, it's a predicate on the positioning and how they can rotate around. I watch the lidocaine dose, and remember that Complications go up as the number of veins treated increase. Next slide. I'll usually do the anterior and the greater together if they're both incompetent. I'll access the GSB distally and then use the uh, needle and access wire and uh, cannulate the anterior accessory vein for a purchase. I can then dial it up with a sheet so I can use one sheet for both veins. 
Next slide. You can differentiate the anterior accessory from the greater saphenous by how the anterior accessory aligns with the femoral artery. Next slide. I use thermal ablation for the AV and the GSV at the same time. If the AV is tortuous, I'll use a skewer technique with my needle and then uh, do the thermal ablation or I'll back away from the uh, straight segment of the AAV, infuse uh, local and then use a skin bridge to get the adequate length. Next slide. So in this patient, you would have adequate subfascial straight AAV you could do thermal ablation. If it's more tortuous, say in this next slide, uh, I might skewer the vein or do a, a skin bridge to get out of the length for thermal ablation. Once I've ablated approximately, uh, then I either do a phlebectomy or form sclerotherapy distally. For microphlebectomy as defined and described by Mueller originally, it was thought to be a heresy not to have proximal and distal control of the veins, but it really has been a game changer. Next slide. It's ideal for veins like these, uh, where they're ropey varicosities, uh, and they really have an ideal cosmetic result. Next slide. It's not ideal for patients with C5, lipodermatosclerosis, uh, thick woody skin, where hemostasis will be a challenge and heel wing will be difficult. Next slide. But the concept is to extract the vein without proximal and distal control through small one to three millimeter incisions. Next slide. So I call it ambulatory phlebectomy. The residents call it nick and pick. Uh, I hate that the insurance company call it a stab phlebectomy because patients are always frightened when they hear that I'm going to stab them. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, I'll occasionally do the phlebectomy and the closure as a single stage that has the advantage of immediate results. You can avoid multiple procedures. Uh, you may be doing unnecessary work because some veins will decompress on their own. When you do an increased procedure, the complication rate goes up and you have to keep an eye on your local complications. I'll often do a blade and wait because some veins will resolve on their own and need no more procedures. Uh, most decompress substantially. Most do come to need a, a microphlebectomy or foam sclerotherapy later, uh, but you can usually do it with less work. And there are important con insurance considerations. The microphlebectomy is uh, considered a global procedure and you try to get all your percutaneous work done before you hit the global procedure. So I do all of these in the office. It's a side 11 office-based procedure. Next slide. I never do them in the medical center. Uh, note here the financial advantage of doing them in an office fit or a side 11. Next slide. Next slide. So you don't need the uh, huge tray that you get of instruments at the uh, OR in the medical center. Next slide. I have all of my instruments on a single male stand, just a handful of our instruments are all that are required. Uh, listed here are the tools that I use. Next slide. I personally mark every patient. I don't delegate this task to anybody. I have a code. Uh, the lines are larger veins. The circles are perforators and valves. The dotted lines are the smaller veins. And I use indelible ink. I have the patient stand on a homemade stand like this so I can use a stool as I mark them. And uh, it prevents me from getting on my hands and knees on the floor. Next slide. So I don't use epinephrine, I use the usual tumescent recipe. Next slide. I always use a, a Klein pump. I turn the rate down so there's uh, less discomfort. Next slide. With one wheel on one edge uh, with a 30 gauge needle, I can anesthetize the whole area by slowly advancing the tumescent needle uh, behind the wave of analgesia. Next slide. A critical piece is to have an assistant that can engage the patient. They can uh, set the patient's mind at ease. They'll often tap the patient on the shoulder to distract them as I do their initial 30 gauge wheel. Once I have the wheel, I'll inject uh, through the advancing wave of tumescent. It causes a hydrodissection that helps extract the vein and it also provides hemostasis. 
I don't discontinue anticoagulation. If they're on Coumadin, I make sure they're not super or subtherapeutic pre-op. Uh, I never use antibiotics. I don't have an IV. And I do put them in Trendelenburg to minimize uh, bleeding and promote hemostasis. I try to make the NICs all at once. Once I involve, uh, induce analgesia, I make all my NICs to conserve motion. I then orient the microphlebectomy incisions in a random pattern so there'll be no recognizable pattern from a distance. Next slide. I have just a handful of instruments. I use the larger hooks for larger veins and the smaller hooks for the smaller veins. Next slide. The hemostat should never traverse the skin, only the microphlebectomy hooks. And I use an 18 gauge needle for small veins and I use a, an 11 blade for the larger veins. Once I have the vein extracted, I put on traction and the palpation helps me identify the next vein. Next slide. My resins say it's like the little rascals where you uh, kind of seesaw back and forth uh, with a vein and you can identify about palpation. Next slide. When I'm done, I just use stair strips. I never use a suture. I never use adhesives. And I cut the stair strips in thirds. Next slide. Uh, and then orient them longitudinal with the incision. I use an eccentric uh, dressing, uh, compression for 24 hours, bed rest in the room for five to 15 minutes, cardio activities that day, non steroidals and again, never narcotics. I use foam chemical ablation for branches off the axial veins, for the distal GSV and SSV to avoid nerves. I like them for the C five and six patients. I use the foam to back up after I've thermobladed perforators. And uh, it's important to have patients that are willing to tolerate the inflammation and the lumpy bumpy uh, veins afterwards. So the foam chemoablation works by lysing the endothelium, promoting inflammation, fibrosis, and closing the veins. Next slide. I use the Tessari method, four to one, CO2 to 1% polydocanol, uh, back and forth, moving with a 3A stopcock, 25 or 30 cycles. The foam has uh, surface area properties that creates vasospasm and increases the efficacy of the polydocanol. Uh, when I do physician compounded, I use CO2 to avoid the risk of nitrogen and uh, neurologic complications. Once I have access, I uh, use it to seri method and then elevate the leg for the chemoablation. Next slide. Please note that the complications increase with the amount of volume used. Now, if you use the polydocal and to seri method, it's uh, known as off-label. That's a difficult spot to be in if the patient has serious complications. Now with the FDA available of Arathena, uh, which there have been no significant neuro complications uh, reported with Arathena. The, an important consideration with Arathena is it's $71 a cc. So if you use 10 cc's or 15 cc's, uh, it's an expensive intervention. The Arathena does have superior properties in terms of poise and it stays uh, in a foam rather than degenerating uh, in a superior manner to physician compounded. Next slide. Once I get access into Trendelenburg, I elevate the leg. I just make a sling with an IV pole. I leave the leg elevated for oh, five or 10 minutes. Uh, I'll often come back after I mark a second patient to do the injections. I inject Andegrade and the foam through buoyancy properties will track along all the incompetent, incompetent tributaries and the uh, volume of foam needed is much less and it goes into uh, all of the pathologic branches off the incompetent axial vein. Next slide. Uh, Barathena makes a, a, a rest you can use. Uh, some uh, patients with knee problems tolerate this better than a sling. A uh, sling on an IV pole though will get a, a higher degree of elevation, which I prefer. Next slide. Next slide. And then I use uh, eccentric compression. The foam rolls come with Varathena. If I run out of foam rolls, I make uh, eccentric compression just out of foam rubber that I cut myself. Next slide. I'll move on and wrap up with perforators. Um, the uh, perforators 
or can communicate the superficial to the deep. Next slide. Next slide. With the calf muscle pump, uh, they're directed from the superficial down to the deep if they function correctly, as shown here. Next slide. Uh, they have uh, eponyms and also anatomic names, uh, most know well. Next slide. It's important to differentiate incompetent versus pathologic. The societies find pathologic is greater than three and a half millimeters, refluxing over 500 uh, milliseconds and in proximity to an ulcer. Next slide. Next slide. There are two mechanisms of pathologic perforators. Uh, one is uh, anti-grade overlay, uh, overload, next slide. And the next is uh, retrograde blowout, next slide. Next slide. It's important to note that the mechanisms of failure determine the severity and the response to therapy. Retrograde blowout, fare the poorest. So I intervene when the veins are uh, greater than three and a half and when they have advanced symptoms and reflux greater than 500 milliseconds. Next slide. The SVS guidelines are that it's indicated for advanced CVI for pathologic perforators, proximity to an ulcer, failed superficial therapy, that is after the axial veins are treated and if they have no deep vein disease. Uh, and uh, SVS does not recommend it for C2 disease. However, in certain circumstances, I'll use it for C2 disease. Next slide. As well, I do these only in the office, uh, side 11 charge. The hospital or ambulatory surgery center uh, treatment is outdated. So we know that with incompetent perforator veins and severe chronic venous insufficiency, it's associated with incompetent perforator veins uh, if you treat it, it reduces ulcer recurrence and it can speed healing. Next slide. Next slide. So let's go into C2 varicosities briefly. Next slide. If they have no axial reflux and it's the highest point or inflow to um, varicosities, I'll treat the incomp uh, incompetent perforator vein. Next slide because the incompetent perforator vein is a common cause of recurrent varicose veins. Increased incompetent perforator veins are associated with increased varicose veins. And in select patients, the incompetent perforator vein therapy will resolve the varicose veins. Next slide. This would be an example of me taking care of a C2 patient who has an incompetent perforator vein. Next slide. Technically, I define it uh, myself at the time of the procedure, uh, confirming the reflux. Next slide. I turn color off to uh, line up the axis of the perforator target. Next slide. I then uh, inject some local. Next slide. I'll go with the next slide. Then uh, with uh, the incompetent perforator cannulated, I'll inject local around that. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, with the needle visualized above the fascia, not near the um, subfascial components, I'll uh, spot weld it with the thermal ablation. Next slide. I take care that the impedance and the temperature are correct. Next slide. I'll spot weld it for 30 seconds in each of four quadrants. Then I'll pull it back five to 10 millimeters and spot weld it again for 30 seconds in each of four quadrants. Next slide. Once the incompetent perforator is sealed, I'll back it up by foaming the superficial vein right behind the perforator. And that prevents a, the foam from going into the deep system. Next slide. I make my foam uh, one to one for a liquid to gas with 1% polyethylene. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of the uh, backed up uh, varicosities behind a spot welded incompetent perforator. Next slide. So post procedure, I encourage gentle cardio starting the day of the procedure. I ask them to leave the wrap on for 24 hours, eccentric compression, 
non-steroidals, no narcotics. And I coached him that it will be bruised, inflamed, and quotes, lumpy bumpy. Next slide. So we've seen a, a remarkable change in therapy from the open stripping, which is what I did at the start of my career. Next slide. And we've witnessed a, a spectacular disruption of the open superficial vein treatment by uh, percutaneous and uh, minimally invasive techniques. We've seen it progress from pin stripping, next slide, to microphlebectomy, next slide, to thermal ablation, next slide, to non-thermal ablation. And, and fortunately, uh, we were well positioned to embrace the endovenous disruption. We benefited by observing up close the devastation uh, wrecked on our cardiac surgeon colleagues by catheter-based interventions. And critical was our culture that remained disease process-centered and outcomes-driven. We were forewarned and prepared and we harnessed the asymmetric advantage we had of perspective, motivation, and skill uh, to do something that no other especially could. And we engaged and incorporated catheter-based techniques in earnest. Next slide. So how can we uh, make sure that we won't be devoured by the next disrupting technology. And how can we avoid the innovator's dilemma? That is where our strengths don't become our weakness. How can we remain strong and well positioned to deliver excellent care for our patients with venous disease in the future? One of Christensen's causal theories tells us uh, that what kills a successful enterprise like venous therapy today is that something will attack us from the bottom of the market. Next slide. It tells us with causality that if our specialty fails, it will be because we only do procedures. We focus on the high margin tier of the vascular market. The wrong measuring stick, say income from high margin cases, such as RFAs, can produce a recipe for failure that might look something like this. Next slide. Let's derm let dermatology treat those telangiectatic spider veins, those tennis club divas are hard to please and it doesn't pay much, they can call me if they need a closure. Next slide. So we just lost the bottom tier of our market, but that's okay because we have more time to do our high ROI closure procedures. Next slide. Well, I don't have time to admit DVTs. But why don't you have the hospitalist admit the DVT and they can call me if the patient needs lytic therapy and a stent for the May Therners. Next slide. Now the next tier of our uh, patient base is gone, but that's okay, it feels pretty darn good. I'll have more time to do what I do best. I'll do some uh, GSB closures, next slide. You know, I don't like to manage wounds and pick scabs. Uh, I'll just ask them to call me if the patient needs an RFA. Next slide. Now one more layer of our patient base is gone, next slide. You know, I don't embolize, um, uh, those pelvic veins, let's have IR do it. Uh, it's hard to get reimbursed for that procedure and those patients uh, require a lot of counseling. Next slide. And I know we'll lose a chance to be part of uh, that patient base, but that's okay. Uh, part of our market's gone. Next slide. Now I don't really have time to participate in registries and outcomes data. Um, or I can't really afford to take time to learn new techniques. Next slide. I know insurance plans will probably someday select providers that provide uh, low cost and high quality. And I'll get to that when I have to. I'll spend time doing what I do best. Now a big chunk of our patient base is gone. Next slide. Well, now um, that's all before non-surgeons uh, get involved. The family practice doctors, obstetricians, and practitioners decide to do axial vein closures with non-thermal non-tumescent techniques. And it's uh, easier for them uh, to build revenue that way. And besides, they control the patient. Well, what can I say? I need their referrals and like my cardiac surgical colleagues, they'll call me this time to do what I best, do best, all of lay veins. So now we're sitting on our hands and our specialty is collapsed. So it's absolutely critical to continue our position of leadership and strength and be able to bring important contribution to our patients that we choose wisely our measuring stick for success. Next slide. 
So now that we're aware of our failure modes, uh, what's a recipe for success? And it's the same if we're in an academic or in a private practice. And the answer lies with Christensen's theory of a job to be done. Next slide. Next slide. So we must uh, focus on what the patient needs and not frame them by our attributes. If you work to understand what job you're being hired to do, the payoffs will be enormous. So what do job do our patients hire us to do? Well, although there is a correlation, our patients don't hire us because they're female, uh, because they stand a lot of their work, because they're multiparous, or because they've inherited an unfavorable genome predisposition for vein problems. Our vein patients hire us to fix their broken blood vessels. Next slide. So to stay relevant, we need to fix broken vessels with the best methods available. It could be a scalpel, suture, RF catheter, sclerosing foam or glue, or even an eye of newt or toe of frog. We must say, I'm not a surgeon that just operates. We must say, I take care of my patient's broken veins. And we must shrug off the impulse that prompts us to just work a little faster and book another case. Because our job is to champion the patients by fixing their broken veins, we must scan for, identify, and vet any new method. As Gretzky puts it, we need to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is now. Crucial to the durability of our specialty and our career in veins is championing our patients. And we have to evaluate and, com and use comparative effectiveness for uh, all tools available. We must be involved with designing and committing to clinical trials, registries, and vet the effectiveness of any new therapy. That will ensure that we stay in a leadership position for our patients. Next slide. As we've learned from the patient, the painful disruption of cardiac surgery, we can't just strengthen our skills and we can't wait until we see a downturn in our business because at that point it's too late. Deeply compelling is the importance of developing new skills and competencies versus simply strengthening existing ones. Next slide. So history teaches us that there will be new technology and there will be new therapies and the next generation of disruptors is in our midst. And they are listening to the Zoomcast. They're with our residents and fellows. They're in the research labs there in Houston and they're on the engineer's easels. Next slide. And these disrupting tools will be characterized by simplicity, affordability and convenience. And as we did uh, with the intravenous progress, we must stay, stay positioned to embrace and own the next disruptor and uh, be positioned to embrace our future in, in uh, managing this medical condition. And remember to do so, we must remain disease process centered, outcomes driven and patient focused. And one thing's for sure, the next disruptor is on its way. Uh, Ulysses, I'll wrap up with that and be glad to uh, discuss. Excellent presentation, Scott. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I okay. do well. That, that's a phenomenal presentation because, uh, you know, it touches the basic topics of how the uh, practice of uh, vein surgery, vein therapeutics uh, have changed in the past 20 years. And I was thinking that this presentation could be uh, very informative and, and helpful to do a specific uh, group of demographics here, demographic groups, the newly graduated vascular fellows and the ones like me that we are in the fourth quarter of our professional career because we need to adapt to whatever is changing. I think this, this is important. Now, in regards of something that you mentioned to you, uh, that you mentioned earlier, people sometimes, uh, colleagues have trouble understanding that arterial practice is different than venous practice. Everybody uh, sees down the veins, like it's very easy, it's not problematic, take care of a vein uh, pathology. But I found through my career that, you know, I do 100% uh, veins, um, it's as complicated as arterial. That is some uh, misleading information that some colleagues and some professionals uh, uh, have. And now, in, in the area that you are over there in Knoxville, um, what is the group of physicians out of vascular surgery that takes care of veins uh, uh, most commonly? 
Uh, are they cardiologists, interventional radiologists, family practice? Who, who is in your experience there? Who is? Uh... What's happened in East Tennessee is that the franchises have eclipsed the arterial uh, vascular surgeons in the medical centers. And it's because the, the business model of trying to treat veins um, in between arterial patients is, is a failed concept. The, these patients don't want to fight for parking. They don't want to uh, have multiple IVs and blood draws. They don't want to get bumped by a trauma. They don't want to sit next to someone in the waiting room in shackles. Um, they want uh, ease and convenience and especially care. So I think for vascular surgeons and academics to stay involved, they have to change their business models. Now, I think that the, they have some leverage. They can leverage their deep vein capabilities. They can leverage their referral networks. Um, Correct. They can leverage economies of scale in, a term, in terms of purchasing power. Correct. But I think they're going to have to get a new business model, not just piggyback it onto their existing arterial model. Correct. Uh, another, um, that we have a question here, uh, what typical age group are affected by venous disease in your experience? What is the peak of the uh, prevalence of this problem? For me, there's a bimodal distribution. Uh, I see a lot of uh, patients who are uh, postpartum and middle age. Uh, maybe they stand a lot for their career, uh, they're multiparous and they're uh, middle age. And then I see more senior patients that have more advanced uh, vein disease, and usually there's the C5-6 patients. Correct. Uh, another question one of our viewers has is, if has COVID impacted any of your patients that you've been working with? Uh, uh, COVID has impacted my practice. Uh, when our hospitals in the region shut down for elective practice, I shut down my outpatient vein practice. Ironically, at that point, there was not much penetration of COVID in our community. Now we're open and doing patients. There's quite a bit of COVID penetration here. We changed the uh, practice in our waiting room. We don't have families waiting in the waiting room. And it's, it's worked out very nicely. It's very quiet in the waiting room. It's very efficient. And we have the families wait outside and we call them on the phone and walk them out to the car. Uh, so that's actually made things run smoother. And uh, patients now that didn't have the vein treatment during the COVID shutdown are catching up. So our volumes are actually up and we've just about caught up to our uh, numbers for this uh, point in the year, for the year 2020. Correct. Now, I, I, we are almost out of time. We are going to extend a couple minutes because we start late. But I, I, you know, you mentioned that you do not stop anticoagulation when you do your ablations, right? And, and, and neither, neither did I for all the past 17 years that I've been doing veins, but just recently had a patient that did an ablation, a term ablation. Uh, he is on Coumadin for atrial fibrillation, and 24 hours later, he developed this tremendous hematoma in the thigh. It's the first one that ever happened uh, to me, and uh, the patient is doing fine now, but uh, you know, it makes me some, you know, that says that takes one patient to change some of your angle. So now I yeah. think I'm going to be more careful regarding that. Uh, have you seen any of these issues with anticoagulation and doing uh, uh, thermal ablation? When I'm working on veins, I'm more concerned about uh, deep vein thrombosis than I am about bleeding since it's a low pressure system. And they do bleed a little longer. And I think the hematomas are uh, a, a little larger when I don't discontinue the anticoagulation. But I think that that's so far for me been pretty manageable. And that's an acceptable complication in contrast to a, a deep vein thromboembolic complication. If they're on Coumadin, I do check before the procedure to make sure that they're not super therapeutic or subtherapeutic. If they're on an NOAC, I usually hold it that morning but then they take it when they get home that afternoon. And I have had some patients bleed after the procedure. Usually they make it about as far as a waiting room before they start to bleed. And it's not much of a crowd pleaser and it, it doesn't instill confidence in the people in the waiting room. Uh, and it's, it's pretty graphic, but it, uh, I found if I'm careful, if I walk them around in the procedure room for a while uh, to test it, if they're on anticoagulation, I keep them 
uh, with their leg elevated for uh, five or 10 minutes longer than usual. Uh, and then I teach a patient if it bleeds, once they leave, just to be sure to get their leg elevated. And it's, it worked all right for me. Great. We have uh, one more question for our viewers. Uh, says here, what are some visual signs or symptoms that indicate I might have implications developing? I guess um, implications, I mean, probably complications or it might get uh, worsening of the, of the venous disease. What are visual signs or symptoms that may indicate this? You know, it's interesting. I'll often ask my patients if their uh, legs are causing symptoms, I'll say no. And then I'll say, well, are your legs aching heavy? Yes. Yeah. Do they swell at the end of the day? Yes. Um, do they itch? Yes. Uh, I had the uh, veins on my right leg fixed about a year ago. And of course, my kids would tell me they look gross when I was out in, the, in my shorts on the weekend. I told my kids they didn't bother me much. And they said, well, isn't that what you do, Dad? So I finally got mine fixed. And I was, it was very dramatic how, how much lighter my leg feels how much less achy it is at the long of the end of a long operating day. And uh, I didn't realize how dramatic the symptoms were because they crept up kind of subtly on me. So I would say achy, heavy, swelling, itching, all are signs of vein problems. Correct. Sometimes you know, I've had patients with restless legs have resolution of their symptoms. I'd say about 30% of the time. Okay. One, one other thing that I observe, at least in my practice, like you said, I'm echoing what you just said. The patient said, I have no symptoms. I don't have anything. You start asking them, and slowly the symptoms start coming to light. The other thing is they sometimes don't use compression garments, and you prescribe the, correction, the correct compression garment. They come back to the follow-up, and they realize how the legs should feel right? They, they, they feel lighter and they didn't know they had a problem because normally there are people that go, go, go. They don't have time to complain. Hardworking people and they don't pay attention to the, to the symptoms. They wear the compressions and they realize what is the normal feeling that they should have, right? It's interesting. Insurance companies often say, have they failed compression stockings? And what I've noticed is that if the compression stockings make their legs symptoms improved, it's a good indicator they will benefit from uh, venous interventions. Correct. So one last question before we, uh, we close this. It is from our viewers. It says, hello, I've been healthy throughout my life, but I've been experiencing a bit of pain behind my knee slash calf. Does DVT typically lead to pulmonary emboli? Good question. DVT doesn't typically uh, lead to pulmonary emboli, but it can. And uh, I would get an ultrasound to make sure that there's not a, a deep vein thrombus. And if there is, I would treat it uh, with anticoagulation. And if there's not, then I would uh, put my mind at ease. Correct. And uh, one more, the, one of our fellows uh, asked about the tumescent, the recipe for tumescent that you were describing. Um, they replace in their practice the uh, sodium bicarbonate for Ringer's lactate instead of saline due to some complications that might be reported in the literature with that. And also they add solumedrol, which reduces significantly the inflammatory response or the inflammation response after the thermoablation. A any, any thoughts about that, Scott? Uh, I think lactate Ringer's is a, a great, a great uh, workaround and I think that's a fine idea. I've not heard of solumedrol, but it's, it sounds like it's uh, very sound principles. Yeah, uh, Ruth Bush, I don't know if you know her, she is very uh, active in the vein, vein field. She is here in Houston. She uses uh, solumedrol in her tumescent uh, and uh, that reduces dramatically the inflammation, of course, in the first you know, 24, 48 hours after the procedure and then loads the patient with ibuprofen and that, well not loads the patient, but it recommends taking ibuprofen and the transition is very smooth. So th those are a couple of points. Any, anyway, uh, Scott, anything else you want to add before we wrap this? Uh, oh, Ulysses, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's an honor. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, this is uh, your forum. Anytime you want to come and, uh, and talk, you are welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation, Scott.
Stay well. Happy Thanksgiving to you and to all the listeners. Great. Uh, to all our viewers, we wish you happy Thanksgiving. Be happy, be safe, be smart, and we'll see you next month. We will have a show on December 23rd, and we'll see you then. Thank you so much, and a happy Thanksgiving Day to all of you. God bless you.